guys. You guys ever thought about like uh, when you think about the successful people that you see either, you know, around you or that you follow in the media, like what personality qualities strike you as their main characteristics? Like when you look at successful people, what usually comes to mind when you think about them? Charismatic, okay. Vain, okay. Man, we just went there, didn't we? <laughs> what else? Intelligent, okay. Confident. Tall. There you go. Good looking. <laughs> well, maybe. We may challenge that in just a moment. <laughs> Driven, maybe, you know. Those are some of the characteristics we think about, aren't they? And here's the other side of this. But when we think about them maybe before they were successful, do you think they were always that way? Do you think they were always the way they are? Or would you say that now as we see them successful, that success possibly changed them? We think. Think so? Probably. Some of them. Yeah, absolutely some of them. Um, yeah, with some of them, you can't deny that they absolutely have changed, though. And I was just thinking about even just the physical things that we see about people. I have some examples for you. For example, take a look at this picture. Anybody know who this is? That is, but let's put up her now. Think she's changed physically? A little bit. What about this next one? Anybody know who that is? <laughs> Elon Musk. Let's look at him today. Hair does not grow back just for the record, so something has happened there. <laughs> or this one right here. I'm really not familiar with this person. That's Khloe Kardashian, yes, but let's look at her today. That's not even the same person, right? I got one more for you. What about this guy right here? That is offensive, but I wish I had his money. I wish I had his money. That would be Brent Clark circa 1994, so just so you know. No, anybody know who this is? Jeff Bezos. Look at him now. Anything change? <laughs> just a little bit. Okay, so just to be fair, we're having a little bit of fun at their expense. I'm not, that's not a criticism of them, but they, you can't deny that they've changed their looks and I think often, if you look deeper in their lives, more than that's changed. You know, just even how they live, how they interact with people. I mean, sometimes we hear about people, when they get success, their spouses tend to change uh, because of their success. We hear horror stories sometimes of celebrities who, in restaurants, will mis mistreat wait staff or, you know, just treat people like garbage or celebrities or whatever. Unfortunately, success, fame, celebrity, and wealth often comes with an attitude that says, I am important, I am all that, and you are not, so I can push you around, abuse you, grab you, do whatever I want to you because of who I am and the status that I've achieved. And that's just my right. So treat, you know, they would say, so treat me as such, or I will step on you like the cockroach that you are. You know, we see that sometimes, don't we? That success really does change people. The weird thing about the culture we're currently in is that instead of pushing against that mentality, we seem to celebrate it. We seem to embrace it and even strive for it in some ways. It's really weird. We even try to emulate it. And I just, as I thought about that, I thought, God help us that we would ever try to emulate that type of behavior. But I was reading a, this week an article online that was actually called, Does Success Change You? Look at what the author of this article said. See if you agree or disagree. It says, success doesn't change you. It simply magnifies who you are. He continues to write. He says, if you are a generous person when you're only moderately successful, the success makes you even more generous. If you're a selfish person before success, then success makes you even more selfish. If your nature is to be caring, giving person, then success makes you more so. If your nature is to be materialistic, you become more materialistic. If you're a competitive person, you become even more competitive. If you like helping others, you end up looking for ways to help even more people. What do you think? Is that a good statement there? I think so too. I think there's truth in that statement, that success doesn't necessarily change us. It just magnifies who we deeply are 
at the core. And well, today, as we continue our journey through the life of Joseph in the Old Testament, in the series we're calling Living the Dream, we're going to look at the next phase of his life, where Joseph has grown up, he's matured a little bit, he has not just a little bit of success, he has a tremendous amount of success, and we're going to look and see how does he respond to that success, why does he respond the way he does, and even what happens when that success is unjustly and literally stripped from him. That's what we're going to look at today. Remember where we left off last week? The end of Genesis chapter 37, it said this. It said, Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. So he'd been sold by his brothers, life spared, not killed, sold as a slave to these traders. They take him down to Egypt. They immediately sell him, get their money back by selling him to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials. Now, if you're reading along in, the, in Genesis, you'll notice that there's like kind of a, a pause in Joseph's life in Genesis 38. There's a really strange story about Joseph's brother Judah. Um, if you have time to read it, you can, but we're, we're not going to deal with that one today. It's a whole different storyline. Uh, so we jump 38 and go to 39, where we pick up the story today, and here's what we read. It says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph, so he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Did you get the things that were repeated over and over and over and over in six short verses there? Remember, repetition is there on, on purpose, is to show us a recurring theme right here. And one, once we look at Joseph, wouldn't we look there and say, wow, what a reversal of fortune. From the pit where his brothers are saying we're going to kill him, to being sold as a slave, and now, and not just that, in a foreign land, and he's all grown up. Evidently, he's matured a little bit. We see that he's no longer the little tattletale punk daddy's boy that he was before, you know. And he's a hard worker, evidently. He's got to be trustworthy, right? Because Potiphar's basically given him everything. He's got the respect of the boss, and he's rewarded for it. And his rise to prominence in Potiphar's house, it's interesting. It's very fascinating because just like for many of us, he didn't come in and start right next to Potiphar. Potiphar didn't just say, oh, here's a new slave. Here you go. Here's all the stuff. No, I, I would have missed this. I read it this week, but it's like he would have started as someone, a servant out in the field. That's where he would have began. He had started at the bottom. And somehow with his work ethic, with what he did, with how he interacted with the other servants and with the, with the managers, he's, he's noticed and he's brought not just into the field, he's brought into the house and he begins to, to serve there. And he has, you know, reign over the house. And not just that, then he's moved, even graduated, uh, promoted even more to be Potiphar's attendant. That's his body man. You know, that's the person right next to him until the point where Potiphar's just like, all right, here, fine. I'm tired of dealing with it. I'm just going to sit over here and worry about what's for lunch. You've got everything else. That's quite a, try to transition, isn't it? I mean, it's quite a rise that everything now in Potiphar's house is under, under Joseph's care. Why? Why was it that way? Well, you heard it, right? I mean, it was repeated multiple, multiple times. In fact, five times in six verses, we are told that the Lord was with Joseph, blessed Joseph, and blessed the household because of Joseph. How do you feel about this? When you hear that Joseph, God's with him, things are prospering. Does it make you feel good? It does, doesn't it? It makes us feel good. We think good for Joseph. You know, you worked hard, you pulled yourself up out of tragedy, and you became successful. And we want the story to end there and be a nice, and they all lived happily ever after, but we're going to find out in a moment it doesn't end there. It's going to take another turn. So let's just keep reading. Verse 6 says this, now Joseph was well-built and handsome. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, you heard it. 
This is not said of many people in the Bible. It was said of Joseph's mother that she was a beautiful woman. Good genes, that's right. As one commentary I read but this week put it, they said, Amid Joseph's many blessings, he suffers from one endowment too many, stunning beauty. <laughs> and I cannot share Pastor Amy's comments in our message community this week. They are not safe for work in what she thought about Joseph. So not only is he a hard worker, he's good looking too. Don't you just hate these people? Don't you just, I mean, it's like the celebrities that are amazing, act, like Scarlett Johansson. Let me just throw this out there. Beautiful woman, great actress, and she was in the animated film Sing, and she's got an amazing voice. I mean, seriously, come on. All that talent in one person. I understand how Joseph's brothers felt now. You know, I mean, they, she, he's got it all going for him, but that beauty is going to be the thing that gets him in trouble. Let's keep going. And after a while, after we know that he's well-built and handsome, after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. Man, don't you love the scandal of the Bible? The story is getting good. What is he going to do? Remember how we talked about successful people? There's a word that often describes successful people. Entitled. Is Joseph in his rise to prominence, going to feel entitled. Let's find out. It says, but he refused. Oh, with me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day after day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. We don't want to miss this. This woman is ruthless and relentless. Day after day, she's after him, calling him, Oh, Joseph, where are you at, Joseph? Come here, Joseph. Hey, Joseph, I dropped something. Can you pick it up for me? I mean, put yourself in this story. This is what's going on. And he's a smart guy. He's obviously a guy with integrity as well, isn't he? Because he says, nope, not falling for that one. What I find fascinating is the reasons why Joseph gives for saying no. I mean, let's just be fair. How many would say no? How many people, when someone is throwing them at you, really do have the ability and the, the wherewithal to be like, absolutely not. But look at the reason Joseph gives for, for not giving in to this temptation. He starts with, I've been trusted. Look, at I, I have the trust of Potiphar. Everything in this house is under my care. He trusts me. I can't do that because of his trust. And then he says, and not only that, not just because of his trust, Think about what this would do to our relationship. This would be an incredible offense against Potiphar. How could I possibly do that to him? Not just because of the trust, but to him. And then the biggest one of all, he says, look, this wouldn't just be a sin against you. It wouldn't be a sin just against Potiphar. It would be a sin against God. As I was thinking through this this week and doing some reading, it kind of jumped out at me that, the reasons that Joseph gives for not doing it are oftentimes the reasons many people would give to give in. The master trusts me. Why wouldn't I be able to have his wife too? I mean, he's put everything in my care. That could include her. I mean, after all, God is the one who blessed me. He's put me in this position. Surely he means for me to enjoy myself here. See how even... The reasons for not doing it can become the reasons to do it. Isn't that fascinating? He says no. He doesn't even give in a little bit. He says absolutely not. And really, I want the story to close there. And Joseph lived happily ever after again. But this is where it takes a turn for poor Joseph. Let's keep reading. It says one day he went into the house to attend to his duties. Now, pay attention. He's just doing his job. And none of the household servants was inside. Uh-oh. She caught him by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. 
When she saw that he'd left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew, this foreigner has been brought to us to make sport of us, to screw with us is what she's really saying. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until the master came home. Then she told him this story. That Hebrew slave, that foreigner you brought into this house, he came to us to make sport of me. He came here to just mess with me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story, with his, his wife told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me. Notice the emphasis there. This is how your slave, the one you brought into the house, treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. A lot to unpack here. No one's around. She sees her chance. And even though this is perpetrated by a woman, you cannot miss the power dynamic that's taking place here. There's absolutely a power. He was a slave in the house of Potiphar. She, as the, as the wife, had the power. She has all the cards. Not only that, when you read this, that she grabbed his cloak, that is not she just put her hand gently upon it and said, here, let me take. No, there's a violence implied behind this. To be able to pull off a garment like this would have been surprising and violent for her to do. It would have caught him off guard. But again, he does the right thing. He hightails it out of there. He fled, which implies in the way it's written that he ran like running from defeat in battle to escape death. That's how serious he was about getting out of there. And you know what's fascinating about Joseph at this point? The fate of his life is again going to come down to an article of clothing. Remember the, clo the coat that he had and his brothers used the coat and they hated that stinking coat? Here again is Joseph undone by a coat, a cloak that Potiphar's wife is going to use as a means of deception. Just like the coat was, this cloak will be used here. And we all have heard the expression before, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, right? That's what we see here. Potiphar's wife knows what she must do. And did you catch what she did? She begins by rallying the servants. Now, do you think the servants all love Joseph? Probably not. Have you had a job where some new person came in and got promoted over you? Do you like them very much? Probably not. That's probably how they're feeling about Joseph. Not too good. And so when she comes in and she's like, you guys heard this, right? You guys heard me scream. You guys know what he was doing. He was trying to rape me. He was trying to take advantage of me. And they're like, yeah. Yeah. So what does she do immediately? She rounds up the troops and she builds a consensus of witnesses. Why? Because she knows that her husband trusts Joseph. And if it came down to her word against his, I think she does not so sure about who he would believe. But if, he's got, if she's got witnesses, it's not just her word against Joseph. It's their word against his. And notice how she does it. She, she builds this up. She says, these servants, you know, she tells them, this Hebrew guy, don't miss that. There's a hint of xenophobia here. There's racism going on here. This foreigner that he, he's come, he came and he took your job. How do you feel about that? Yeah, we don't like that. That's right. So let's do something about it. He came here to make sport of us. And then you heard him too. And even with Potiphar, she lays the blame, not just on Joseph, but on Potiphar, this guy you brought us, even implying that Potiphar did it just to mess with his wife. But even the way she tells the story in Genesis, or the way the author of Genesis tells the story, shows us that Joseph did nothing wrong. She takes the truth and she twists it just a bit. That's all it takes sometimes, just a little bit of twisting of the truth in order for some really horrific things to come about. Here she's got his coat in the hand. Someone's got to pay. And so Potiphar has a choice to make. What am I going to do? Really, we're not even sure. You know, the verse said Potiphar, Potiphar burned with anger. Who was he angry at? We're not really told. You realize that if he was really angry with Joseph, 
if he really believed Joseph's guilt, what he would have done is he would have executed him immediately. That was a crime that was death immediately, and no one would have said anything. But he doesn't kill him, does he? He puts him in jail. I wonder if that means he's not fully believing the story, or he just doesn't want Joseph to suffer completely. So he does the unexpected, throws him in prison instead of killing him. That's amazing. But our story isn't done yet. Joseph is in a pit again. He's now in prison again, but it's not done. Look here. It says, while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. Now, hold on. We've heard that before. The Lord is with him again. And he showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for, responsible for all that was done there. There's something about this guy in there. God's with him, and no matter where he is at this point, he's rising to prominence. He's getting, he's getting success and promotion. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Even in prison, God was with him. Eight times in this chapter, we are reminded that God was with Joseph. And here's the kicker, even when it didn't look like it, God was with him, even when it didn't appear so. You see, as I think about the story of Joseph, it's a confusing story sometimes. You know why it's confusing? Because often we carry forward a theology like they had in the ancient Near East. You know how the theology was in the ancient Near East with God? It went something like this. If I am prospering, God is smiling on me. I have the favor of God, and therefore he is pleased with me, and therefore I will continue to prosper. However, if I'm not prospering, if I'm poor, if I'm hungry, if I have need, then that obviously means that God is angry with me, and therefore I need to fix this, this situation so God is no longer angry with me. And this is how we might say it today. God makes good things happen to good people, and bad things happen to bad people. Now, when we say it like that, all of us would say, oh, we don't believe that. But I wonder sometimes if deep down we don't carry a little of that prosperity gospel with us because of the shame and because of the stigma that suffering carries. And we assume that just because you suffer, it means, yeah, God's upset with you. God doesn't like you. But we know this isn't the case. We know that theology is garbage, even if it can slip into our minds occasionally when life throws us curveballs. When you go to the Old Testament, it can actually be a little confusing as well, because you go to places like Proverbs. And Proverbs is an incredible book. It's a book of wisdom, and it tells us, if you do this, this will happen. If you do this, this will happen. I mean, but we all know there's a problem with that, right? Because life doesn't work that way, does it? I mean, I read the passage and it says this. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's Proverbs 22, 6 in the good old King James Version. Do this, and this will happen. Has anybody ever seen that not happen? Has anybody ever seen some of the most faithful, God-fearing, Jesus-following people that you know have children that had no interest in faith at all? Yeah. You see... Proverbs gives us one path of wisdom and says, if you do this, this should happen. But then we also have in the Old Testament books like Job, also wisdom literature. What does Job teach us? Bad things happen to good people, and sometimes we're not even told why. We need the balance of both, because when we read the story like Joseph, we might come into Joseph and we might want to say, yeah, he may have resisted that woman, but he had to do something. I mean, something, he had to make God angry some way because why else would he end up in jail? No. We are told in Genesis 38 there, excuse me, 39, he did everything right. The way it's written pro proclaims the innocence of Joseph. And even as a man of integrity, even as a man who did the right thing, he still ended up in prison. He still suffered. Just like Joseph, there may be times in our lives where we're doing everything right. We're walking with Jesus and we feel very close to God and life still falls apart. We still may have those moments, maybe like Joseph, 
where we wonder where is God. You see, what I think that does when we read these stories and we take Proverbs and, and, and uh, Job together, I think what it does is it can expose the transactional nature of our faith and maybe possibly the entitlement mentality that sometimes we carry around with us in our faith. Now, not that it should be this way, but it's how we still think about it. Well, God, I came to church. I went to church 48 times a year. God, I only missed a month. And I gave money. And God, I, God help me. I have even served in the kids' ministry. And that ought to get bonus points right there. Because anybody who serves in the kids' ministry ought to, you know, you're sitting next to Jesus. And yet I get this diagnosis, and yet this happened with my kids, and yet this happened with my job, and yet this happened with my finances, and this. You see what happens. I think sometimes we hold on to that transactional faith, that entitlement faith. And as I thought about this, I thought, I wonder sometimes if that's not a little bit of what's playing into the deconstructive moment that we see in our culture today. Now, you guys know... I'm not anti-deconstruction. I think all of us enter a process of deconstruction at some point. But I do hear the stories about something bad happens. We're the victim of some legitimate abuse, some trauma, and we place the blame on God. We say, God, how could you? God, where are you? Forget you, God. I'm done with you. But even in saying that, we have to realize with God, we're really owed nothing. If we were sold a transactional or entitled faith, we were sold something that's not found in the Bible. That's not the gospel of Jesus. Bad things are going to happen. Why? Because we live in a broken world. And the thing that will drive us most nuts is when we sit in the question, why? Because oftentimes, many times, we do not find the answer that we're looking for. But the promise of God is that even in the pit, even in prison, even when that dream continues to die over and over and over, God is a God of redemption. God is a God that can make beauty from ashes. He is a resurrecting God who can bring life from death. And as I read this chapter in Joseph's life again this week, I looked at Joseph and I just had to ask the question, who is this guy? I mean, seriously, who are, who are you? Why are you not bitter? I mean, why is he not angry with God, shaking his fist at God, saying, you know, God, what good is it to know you? I mean, could you blame him if that was his attitude? No. It's probably a very human attitude, but he doesn't. Joseph is just this incredible reminder that all, we see, all that we see isn't all there is. That God is not limited by our limited understanding and scope of life. God is not in the box that we often think he is. He sees beyond what we're currently going through. And when you're in the pit of hell and you think there's no way out, there's no ladder, you think it is done and dead, that is when we have to remember we serve a risen Savior. We serve a resurrecting God. And even though Jesus wouldn't say it for thousands of years and the Apostle Paul would write, wouldn't write about it for some time, Joseph is just living out what I think we are called to, a daily taking up of the cross. He's demonstrating what it means to be crucified with Christ. And what I see in Joseph is that he is slowly being transformed into the person God can use to realize the original dream. I mean, just think for a moment back to last week. Little punk Joseph, you know, he has the dream. Could you imagine if that dream was fulfilled in him? Would anybody be happy? Oh, no. But as we move forward and we see through the ups and the downs and through the good times and the trials, it is shaping the character of Joseph. And in a few weeks, we're going to find out exactly what that means. And we're going to see how it causes him to interact 
with the world that is in terrible need because of a famine. You see, if, if Joseph felt, in, he could have easily felt entitled, couldn't he? He could have easily said, look at my position. I've risen to the top. Everything is mine. I'm entitled to everything. But he doesn't. But I wonder how much of that mentality, that entitlement, not just in faith but in life, has permeated our Christian faith. That's the message of the world. I mean, to be honest, isn't that the American dream? You want it. You take it. You deserve it. That is not the way of Jesus. That is not the way of Jesus. And it's not the way of the kingdom of God. And it wasn't the way of the one that God gave this incredible dream to that's going to be used to help sustain the world through famine. But we'll get to that later. We need to get beyond the idea that suffering is bad and that suffering means God isn't with you. Now, we're not, we're not seeking it out. God knows we don't have to. It will find you all on its own, you know. But suffering is not shameful, even self-inflicted suffering, which I don't recommend. But all of it can bring us closer to God if we allow it. Because it's through the suffering and through the pit that we get to know more about God than we could ever know otherwise. One final thought here. You can't read this story and not address the temptation aspect of it. How did he do it? Anybody wondering that? What was it that gave Joseph the strength to say no to the relentless pursuit of a woman? It was a dream, but not only that. There's something else, isn't there? In our society, in our culture, what we say is it's willpower. Anybody believe that? Anybody tried willpower on something you struggle with? How successful was it? Not very. No, it's not self-control. I mean, Nancy Reagan tried to teach us that in the 80s, right? Just say no. That wasn't a great campaign. Push it down. Suppress it. That's not what Joseph shows us. What does he show us? He says, no, I can't. he does say, I can't do this because of my job. He says, no, I can't do this because of Potiphar. But he ultimately says, I can't do this because of my love for God. God was the great love of his life. And as I read this week, a quote from Tim Keller, he said, ultimately, if you look inside and try to suppress desires, you won't be able to keep it up. Real self-control does not come from suppressing the desires of the heart by the will but by reordering the loves of the heart through one overarching, overmastering, supreme love that puts all other loves in their place. And really, the question is, what is our supreme love? What was Joseph's? It was God. What is yours? So here we are again, the end of this message, and we're left with another cliffhanger. What will become of our guy Joseph? Will he be vindicated? Will he spend the rest of his life in prison? What about this woman who got him there? If you're looking for the answer to that, we don't know. For the rest of it, tune in next week as we continue the exciting saga of Joseph living the dream. But please take note of where we end today. Really right where we started spiritually. God is with Joseph. And we're going to see how sometimes God doesn't save us from the tragedy. He actually saves us through it. Let's pray. God, thanks for Joseph this morning and just a reminder of what suffering is, what it can look like, and how sometimes, God, just because we go through the valley of the shadow of death doesn't mean you are unhappy with us. But God, sometimes it's going through that that we find you're more closely with us than we ever thought possible. God, thank you for just what we see here in the life of Joseph. A reminder that we are called to crucify ourselves daily. That even when we're unjustly accused going through the pit, God, you're with us. And we can look up and find salvation. Thank you, God, that you're a God that brings beauty from ashes and life from death. 
God, if there's people here this morning that are in the pit, I just pray that today, this morning, God, they'll be able to open their eyes and just see you more clearly than they ever have. To be reminded of just how amazing your love is and how you sustain us regardless of where we are.